right. Welcome to everyone dialing in and thank you for joining us today. Cargo bikes are a hot topic. We knew this already, but the fact that we had uh, over 800 registrations for this event um, shows just how much interest there is in cargo bikes and in their potential to transform our cities. My name is Jill Warren, and I'm the CEO of the European Cyclists Federation, or ECF. For those of you who don't know us, we're a Brussels-based civil society organization that uh, promotes cycling as a healthy and sustainable means of transport and leisure. With around 70 members in over 40 countries, we unite the cycling movements as the only civil society advocacy voice at the pan-European level. We have some very ambitious goals for 2030. We want the number of kilometers cycled in Europe to double. We want cycling to be treated as a fully fledged mode of transport. And this means prioritizing cycling in the mobility mix and investing in it uh, accordingly. We want the EU to invest 20 billion euros in cycling by 2030 on top of national and local spend. And this investment should include funding the development of at least 100,000 kilometers in high quality cycling infrastructure. At ECF, we've been researching the potential of cargo bikes for a number of years, also together with our advocacy partners, including the cycling industry and with cities, like in the context of innovative EU projects we've been involved in, like the City Changer Cargo Bike Project, which finished last year. That project and its predecessor projects show the enormous potential that cargo bikes have to reduce motorized vehicle traffic, to reduce congestion and noise pollution, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and make the air cleaner, and to make our cities safer and more livable. And we also learned that there's many things a city can do to become more cargo bike friendly, whether through the provision of good infrastructure, reduced speed limits, cargo bike sharing schemes, incentives, uh, or other measures. We created this dashboard to build on these learnings and insights, and today we're making it publicly available with this launch. We want to raise awareness of what can make a city cargo bike friendly, and through the research, we've established a baseline for 125 cities in Europe, and we'll track these developments over time. We'll also use this information in our evidence-based advocacy work, and we hope others will too. And above all, we want to inspire cities to make additional strategic investments and policy decisions that will facilitate a faster and larger scale uptake of cargo bikes by private individuals, businesses, and public services. This project is also of great personal interest to me as a cargo bike owner. Behind me, you see my cargo bike. Her name is Sally. I know that I can fit two crates of beer and three shopping bags in the bucket of that cargo bike. Um, and I really wish that I'd had one of these when my children were very small and I was transporting them around. But my hope is that many more people will be able to use cargo bikes in future to take trips that might otherwise have been taken by car. And I hope we'll see more and more last mile deliveries of all kinds done by bike. My colleague, Anna Karina Reibold, will soon present the dashboard and some of its findings. She and other colleagues at ECF have been working very hard on this since last summer. Um, I wanna congratulate her and the team um, on this accomplishment and also um, to thank all those that have helped them uh, and, and participated in the good cooperation um, that, that has made this happen. And last but not least, I wanna acknowledge and thank the Happy Streets Foundation uh, for giving us the funding um, for the initial work on the dashboard. And I'll now hand over to Anna Karina um, who can, Show, show you what it looks like. So thanks very much and, and over to you. Thank you, Jill. I'm um, just gonna share my screen. So yeah, as um, Jill has just mentioned for the past couple of months, uh, my colleagues and I, we've been researching um, 125 different European cities according to seven indicators to determine their friendliness for cargo bikes. Um, why did we think there's a need for such a tool? Well, you all know that cargo bikes are booming and rapidly becoming more popular. However, this is not happening fast enough. Um, in the meantime, bullet by transportation is responsible for 24% of direct CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. And furthermore, road vehicles are polluting um, our air at unprecedented levels. 
Simultaneously, the sustained growth in e-commerce uh, will increase delivery vehicles in circulation by 36% uh, by 2030. And these numbers are not decreasing. Uh, luckily, we all know there's a solution and it's the cargo bike. Um, cargo bike actually do answer to many of the world's most complicated challenges that are related to our mobility. Um, we know they have a massive potential, but that potential remains mainly untapped. Um, in fact, 50% of all urban trips related to the transport of goods could be shifted to cargo bikes, and a single cargo bike uh, replacing a diesel van saves five tons of CO2 emissions. Yet there's a lack of comparative data and best practice example that often makes uh, planning for cargo bikes very difficult. So what we wanted to do is alleviate this data gap on cargo bikes and establish a baseline data set um, on cargo bikes. We wanted to create a data hub for decision makers, advocates, and um, everyone interested in cargo bikes. Uh, we also wanted to provide easy access to cargo bike data and also create a tool that allows for comparison of data. So we hope that cities will be able to use this uh, dashboard to learn from each other and also to find best practice examples. Um, in our research, we looked at 125 European cities. You can see them here um, on this map. Um, we have included the capital of um, each of these countries, and then the number of cities that are included in the dashboard does include on the uh, does depend on the population size. So, for example, Germany, being the largest country um, in Europe, um, has nine cities included, whereas Poland and France have eight. And then uh, smaller countries might only have one or two cities in a dashboard, but uh, everyone is represented with at least one city. Our data is solely based on publicly available sources. So for that, we mainly use the uh, municipal websites, um, their social media channels, um, and also the press uh, to a certain extent. And our cities and regions recyclist network was also um, activated in the research and we sent them the dashboard uh, for preview um, before publishing it. And uh, our research dates back um, as far as 2018. So we have recorded all cargo bike development since 2018. Here are the different indicators that we use for our research. So those are incentives, uh, sharing schemes. We looked at the urban context, projects, leading by example, inclusion, and manufacturers. When it comes to incentives, we looked at incentive schemes that directly incentivize the purchase of different types of cargo bikes, so e-cargo bikes, um, but also adapted bikes. Uh, as well as scrappage schemes for polluting vehicles uh, that offer a subsidy um, of some kind for cargo bikes as a replacement. When it comes to cargo bike sharing schemes, we found almost 70 um, cargo bike sharing schemes um, in those 125 European cities. And under sharing, we included um, those schemes that have um, some kind of online booking platform uh, we were also able to find plenty um, of cargo bike rental schemes, which are usually um, run by the city um, or tryout schemes, but those are then noted down under projects. When it comes to uh, the urban context, we look at the urban setting of a city and then how far that is made for cargo bikes. Um, here we looked at low emission zones, uh, speed limits, uh, sustainable urban mobility plants, parking spaces for cargo bikes and um, the cycle network. Uh, for projects, we were able to find uh, more than 200 pilot projects in the 125 European cities. Um, here we looked at projects that are initiated by the city or that the city takes part in. Um, when it comes to leading by example, um, this indicator looks at how cargo bikes are being used um, by the public sector for um, everyday tasks such as street cleaning or public libraries um, or municipal communication campaigns. We um, also decided to include an indicator for inclusion because we know that cargo bikes uh, create more inclusive communities uh, where a person's age, background or ability uh, to move does not hinder the participation in social life. And we wanted to have this reflected also in the dashboard. So here we look at uh, different projects and initiatives um, that sort of use cargo bikes as a tool to foster integration and inclusion. So uh, here we have recorded, for example, uh, cycling without age schemes or trainings uh, for families um, on how to use a cargo bike. 
Um, we also looked at many factors sort of based in the different cities. Here we were able to find around 60. And this research we uh, did in collaboration with uh, Cycling Industries Europe. So now I'd like to show you um, the dashboard itself. It's now on, on the ECF website and we're very excited about that. Um, sorry, just one second. Ah, oh, here we go. So this is um, the homepage of the dashboard. Um, the dashboard consists of 130 pages. It is completely um, interactive and all of our research and the things we were able to find just link back to the original source. So almost everything uh, you can click on and um, it will then link you back to the original source. Um, this is what um, a city page looks like. So this is the example for Vienna. Um, each page is gonna look a little different. Um, will sort of depend on the information that we could find for each city, but this is the basic structure. Each city has uh, these five boxes where we have um, uh, recorded our uh, research. Incentives um, are uh, on the upper hand, right hand corner. Um, so we have this graph um, where you can see the maximum amount that is available for each type of cargo bike. So for example, there's um, 1,000 euros available for e-cargo bikes in Vienna. Um, and then below the graph, you will find some basic information on this uh, scheme, like the target group, the time period, as well as the total budget. Um, by clicking on the link, you will then be linked back to the um, original source uh, for the city's website. Um, as I mentioned before, we have been tracking everything since 2018. So next to the graph, you can also see whether the city had incentive schemes in the past. Um, here you can see in these little um, circles. And besides also simply tracking the incentives, we were interested in what impact these schemes have. So whenever possible, we also noted them on how many cargo bikes were purchased uh, thanks to those schemes. Uh, those are uh, the impact is then noted right here. Um, when you see a little um, icon like this, that means there's a little bit of extra information available. Um, so for example, in Vienna, the municipal subsidies can be uh, combined with the national ones, and that way people can then receive more money for uh, their cargo bike. When it comes to um, cargo bike sharing schemes, those are noted uh, next to the incentives here. The city of Cologne is a good example um, as they have different schemes uh, for offer. Uh, so for example, they have the Commons Cargo Bike uh, Casimir, uh, where cargo bikes are seen as a common good and provided free of charge. And they have also just recently launched a new pilot scheme, uh, which involves the local public transport company where um, season ticket holders can ride a cargo bike 90 minutes for free every week. And um, <clears throat> underneath incentives, you will find all the projects that we were able to find for these cities. Um, so this could be EU projects like in Brussels, uh, there was the Cargo Bike project. Um, here we have provided a brief description of the project as well as um, some of the key achievements uh, like the implementation of a Cargo Bike subsidy scheme for businesses and parking spaces in the city of Brussels. And Varna, for example, um, the City Changer Cargo Bike uh, Project enabled tryout schemes for businesses uh, with locally manufactured cargo bikes. And in the city of Graz, for example, you had the city support the creation of uh, cargo bike TV ads that were shown um, on German and Austrian TVs. Um, then under projects, when you click on this little tab, you will also uh, find everything that we were able to find uh, for inclusion. For example, uh, the city of London, they launched a Cycle Your City campaign in 2020 that aims to encourage more women to take up cycling. And as part of that campaign, they uh, offered uh, training, um, also including on training on supporting them to take up, supporting women to take up um, a cargo bike.
and the city of Stuttgart, um, um, as a measure to foster inclusion, they have recently uh, launched a long-term rental scheme um, where cargo bikes can be rented for a minimum of minimum of uh, six months. Um, and the scheme was put in place specifically targeted at low-income income families, and the cargo bikes can be rented for um, 20 euros per month. Um, next to inclusion, you will also uh, find data on how the city is leading by example. For example, in uh, Warsaw, cargo bikes are used um, for um, maintaining public green spaces. And the city of Leipzig, which is also the future host city of Velo City 23, um, delivers um, mail between municipal institutions uh, by cargo bike. Um, then we also looked at the urban context of a city. So here's the, uh, the example for, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I see something different on the, Just one side. Um, you can see the urban context right here, uh, which we have um, visualized um, in the form of a uh, checklist. So we have provided information on whether there's a low emission zone in place. We have also um, tracked the locations of uh, 30 kilometer zones. Um, we had to look at the sustainable urban mobility plans of a city where we also looked at um, whether or not cargo bikes are mentioned as part of the plan. And um, then we try to find evidence of parking spaces in that city. Uh, and Lyon also has cargo bike delivery areas. Um, and if we could find the data, we included information on how many kilometers of cycle lanes there are in those cities. And by clicking on the check marks, it will then take you to uh, the original source. And then, I, as I have mentioned before, uh, we also looked at whether there are cargo bike manufacturers based in those cities. So here are the ones that we could find uh, for Amsterdam, and they're linked to then at the bottom of the page. Besides having pages for uh, each city, um, we have also have European overview pages for some of the indicators. This is the example for sharing. Um, so we were able to find 68 cargo bike sharing schemes um, in the 125 uh, European cities. <clears throat> and um, some cities have up to five, whereas others don't have any sharing schemes yet. And in total, we were able to find uh, that 36 out of the 125 European cities have cargo bike sharing schemes in place. Um, what we also want to demonstrate is how this is gradually becoming a growing movement in Europe. So we have created this map. Um, when you keep an eye on this date, this will show you when the cargo bike sharing scheme was implemented. And when you click on animate, you will quickly see um, how there are more, gradually more cargo bike sharing schemes in Europe. So this is what um, the dashboard looks like. Um, it's now on the ECF website under this link. Um, we will link to it in the chat at the end of this webinar. And now I just wanted to uh, just walk you through some of our um, next steps. So in the future, we do aim to keep this dashboard uh, regularly, regularly updated. And we also want to add a further 125 European cities uh, to this dashboard and also add additional indicators. But this will also depend on the resources and funding we have um, available. Um, this summer, I will be speaking at quite a few conferences uh, where we'll also be presenting some of the results and the dashboard again. So I'll be at the National Cargo Bike Summit in London. Um, we'll, of course, be at Velocity 23 in Leipzig, which is taking place 9th to 12th of March. And then, wait, sorry. And then we will, I will also be at Cargo Bike Sharing Europe in Cologne and at Eurobike in Frankfurt. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me at any time. Um, you can see my email address right here. Um, yeah, thank you very much.
understand. Thank you, Anna Karina. That is so impressive. All that data in the, the dashboard. It's just amazing. I mean, I can see why it's taken since last summer to, to find all of that and process it and analyze it and put it in a, the tracker. But uh, I think it's a very, very interesting result that we hope is inspiring uh, to cities. And now we'd like to have a panel discussion with some very interesting folks from the, the cargo bike scene. Uh, and I will introduce all of them first before we, we ask a first round of questions. So first I would like to introduce uh, Gilda Lagarde, joining us from Vienna. So Gilda was born in France. He studied geography with a focus on tourism and European relations with a focus on corporate social responsibility before working in various industries and countries, including Portugal, Germany, Lithuania, and Austria during the last 20 years. He previously worked for uh, JC Deco's uh, bike sharing system, City Bike Wien, and in, is um, since last summer in charge of the shared mobility topics at the city of Vienna's mobility uh, embassy, Mobilitätsagentur. After a very dynamic phase, the shared mobility offerings are now slowly consolidating around international standards and good practices um, with private players and public organizations working together um, to you know, help achieve this good quality of life uh, for everyone through these measures. And the Mobilitätsagentur is also directly in charge of the cargo bike funding and as such has developed a small generation zero cargo bike sharing uh, called Gretzelrad. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, yeah. And uh, finally, just to say about Gilda, he believes biking is a fun way to discover the world and a smart solution to traffic jam and stress. And we couldn't agree more. And uh, I'd also just like to mention Vienna is in ECF's Cities and Regions for Cyclists Network, um, which is a, a great way for us to uh, interact with them more and, and keep uh, in touch with what they're doing. Second, I would like to introduce Jaron Bornstein. Um, uh, Jaron grew up in Amsterdam, where he studied computer science in the 80s and co-founded a consultancy and software company towards the end of the 90s, which specialized in business intelligence. From 2008, he invested and participated in several startups and gave advice to new starters. Living in Amsterdam with three children, he was an early adopter of the cargo bike at the time without electric support. Now, we know the Netherlands is flat, but with all those bridges over the water, you do have some hills to get up and down. So I can imagine that wasn't always easy. Um, yeah, when his co-founder Yella approached him in uh, 2017 with the idea of starting an electric cargo bike um, sharing company, he didn't hesitate for a second. And that's how Cargaroo got started. And the mission with Cargaroo is to make cities livable again by offering users a fun, sustainable, healthy, and efficient alternative for using the car within a city. Sounds great. Um, next, I would like to introduce Kevin Main. Kevin is the Chief Executive of Cycling Industries Europe, um, which is an international association for cycling businesses. The CIE supports growth in all forms of cycling and highlights the contributions made by products and services to the growth of cycling in Europe. CIE represents cycling-related businesses at the European Union level and runs influential cross-sector expert groups on key industry topics which concern both mobility and industrial ecosystem transitions. Kevin has been a leading figure in cycling uh, advocacy and governance for 25 years. And during this time, he's collaborated, supported, and learned from the cycling community in over 30 countries. He's worked for ECF, for Cycling UK, and held advisory positions to government and expert groups and is a board member of the International Mountain Biking Association Europe. He's a lifelong cyclist who started work in cycling after holding senior positions in international food companies. And when he's not talking about cycling, which isn't very often, um, he's usually out riding uh, as an active tourist, commuter, and mountain biker. So next, uh, we want to introduce uh, Lisbeth de Bruyne. So Lisbeth de Bruyne is a policy advisor on mobility and public space for the city of uh, Ghent. And Ghent is also a member of our Cities and Regions for Cyclists Network, and also uh, Ghent will be the host city for VeloCity 2024. So all Velo citizens on the call and everybody who wants to be a Velo citizen, mark your calendar for June 2024. Um, of course, after this year's uh, VeloCity in, in Leipzig in, in May. 
Um, so Lisbeth, uh, her, uh, her work um, in the cabinet of Deputy Mayor Philippe Boiteau, who many of you may know, focuses on walking, cycling, and people-friendly urban logistics. Lisbeth has coached hundreds of business owners and organizations with the introduction of the circulation plan in Kent, which um, has been very interesting and innovative way to um, foster sustainable mobility in, in that city. Um, and uh, Lisbeth is also a cargo bike devotee. So welcome, welcome Lisbeth. Um, next, uh, I want to introduce Jos Streng from the city of Rotterdam. Rotterdam is also a proud member of our Cities and Regions for Cyclists Network. Um, Jos is a transport planner at the municipality of Rotterdam. His current focus is on clean and efficient city logistics, and his role in the urban freight team is focused on policy development and analysis. Until recently, he was involved in the EU-funded project Harmony, in which the simulation of urban freight traffic played a key role for Rotterdam. Uh, Jos graduated as a hydrologist from the Agricultural University of Wageningen, and following the, the global urbanization trend, his attention has shifted from rural to urban areas and from the flow of water to the flow of traffic. Uh, so welcome, Jos. Uh, and that uh, completes our panel. And I'll turn back to Anna Karina to ask the first round of questions. Um, so we'd like to ask Jeroen to kick off this panel discussion. Can you just tell us a bit uh, more about Cargaroo and how cargo bike sharing has a positive impact on a city and how it helps uh, reach climate targets? Thank you. Hi, Anna Karina. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being part of the panel. And uh, thank you for the ECF to organize this panel. Uh, and thank you for all the people I heard. There are 900 people who registered for listening. Uh, so I hope this will be worthwhile for you. Um, let's uh, first tell you a little bit about uh, when we started, which is almost five years ago. Um, and five years ago, we, uh, we talked to a few cities and they said, yeah, what you're doing is niche. Uh, we thought already then it was not niche, but uh, a lot has, has changed since that time. Uh, I want to share my screen and show you a little bit what we do. One second. Uh, so the first uh, thing is we have a goal in, in our company and that is to make cities livable. And for that, uh, we look a bit broader than only transport uh, because transport has very much to do with how our cities look like and how it is to live in a city. And uh, we as a company, but also personally, I think uh, that uh, lots more space needs to be available for people to walk around, to live in a city and to be able to enjoy, uh, to play, to have more green. Uh, and that means one of the main things you need to achieve as a city as what we think is to uh, get rid of a large part of the cars, which are, by the way, mostly standing still in the city. Um, and one of the most important ways to do that, uh, that's uh, next to city planning, is to offer alternatives for a car, because uh, most cities have plans to reduce cars. Um, but um, when you reduce car, the people that use that car, they need some alternative. And we think uh, and not only we, but I think most people here uh, think that cargo bikes are one of the main alternatives to cars because with a cargo bike, you can transport kids, but you can also transport stuff. You can do grocery shopping, you can do everything. Um, and that's where it distinguishes itself from, for example, scooters, mopeds, uh, and normal shared bikes. Uh, it's not only for transporting a one single person, it's also for transporting stuff and children so this is the main distinguishment between other modes is that it's really an alternative for cars and also for for vents and vents are of course increasing in cities because of all the deliveries and uh, cargo bikes are a main way to to change that uh, so in the beginning we were considered niche but that has changed quite a lot uh, we're getting requests from all over the world to start operating in different cities 
Um, and if you look at the political landscape, I think it's good to mention uh, the EU goal to reach climate neutrality. Uh, there were 100 cities who uh, um, were selected to be 100 to be part of the climate neutral cities in 2030. That's uh, seven years from now. Uh, you can imagine that lots of things need to happen to reach that goal. And one of the things that need to happen are, is, of course, in the realm of transportation. And we think the only way to do that is to reduce the number of cars and uh, offer the people living in those cities alternatives for uh, their car usage. And that's where cargo bikes come in. Um, maybe uh, it's a little bit explanation of how cargo bike sharing in our model, how it works, because it differs a little bit from other modes. Uh, one of the big things that we uh, found out is that uh, for us, it works very well that we have fixed stations. That means that our bikes are on a fixed location. Um, and we are usually located in, in neighborhoods where people live and where there's also some retail. And uh, that means people walk out their door and they should be able to find a cargo bike uh, within two to 300 meters from their home, uh, making it easy for them to use it in their daily life. So we use a fine grid in neighborhoods and uh, our bikes should always return to the same place. And that offers real life bikes certainly have, suddenly have gone to another side of the city. Um, also, we found out that cities very much like the idea that the bikes are on fixed location because it makes it much more manageable, not only for us, uh, because we don't have to relocate bikes, but also for the city, because you don't get uh, huge loads of vehicles in one location, uh, causing uh, hindrance for, for people walking around. Um, as you understand, the cargo bike is a bit bigger than a normal bike. Uh, you don't want 10 cargo bikes standing on one spot because people will get annoyed and are unable to, to, to walk by. So that's why we usually put only one cargo bike on on one spot and in that way we create a very fine grid of, of bikes that can be easily found. Um, so who are our, our target groups? Um, it's, it's young families that are usually the easy and early adopters. That's a very uh, evident use case. You can, uh, in our cargo bikes, you can uh, transport two kits uh, plus a baby, we have a, a maxi cozy adapter where you can uh, transport babies. Um, also, a bit older kids still very much like to be in the cargo bike. My my youngest kid is now nine, and uh, I regularly cycle around with uh, her and two of her friends, and then they make a lot of fun. Uh, they're getting a little bit heavy already, but still, it's it's doable. Um, but not only families are our target group. We all also have lots of uh, students using our bikes and that's uh, for transporting each other but also uh, shopping uh, getting crates of beer it's also very practical then there are starters people who don't have a car and who actually don't want a car which is a growing group in cities in europe people who uh, decided not to have a car and they can very well make use of cargo bikes uh, so they transport all kinds of things. And uh, a group of people that are using our service is uh, small businesses uh, that could be service uh, people like uh, hairdressers, uh, technicians, uh, and also uh, uh, res small restaurants doing their shopping and their, their um, purchasing by cargo bike. Um, I think that's uh, the introduction for what we do. Um, a second question that, that you ask, Anna Karin, is how do cities look upon us? Um, we have been very much in touch with cities from the beginning. Um, and the evolution that has happened over the past few years is that uh, if you look at four or five years ago, there was no policy at all about cargo bikes in cities. And now uh, most of the Western European cities have, uh, as a part of their uh, mobility or shared mobility policy, they have something about cargo bikes, and that's either incentives to purchase them, but we all 
of course, try to persuade them to promote sharing of cargo bikes because um, cargo bikes are better than cars, but shared cargo bikes uh, even take less space than private cargo bikes. So that's an advantage. Uh, and we've been rather successful in getting uh, shared cargo bike policies uh, off the ground in, in many cities. Um, we always uh, talk to the cities where we want to start. Uh, we never just place our bikes like the scooter companies used to do, and they, they've come back from that also, but that's, we never do it that way. So we always cooperate with the cities, um, always ask them what, what is your... What are your policies? What, what do you want? What do you not want? And in most cities, we even uh, coordinate the exact locations of our individual bikes with the city. So we go uh, to the city with a list of neighborhoods where we would like to be. And then they tell us, uh, yeah, here you can do it, there you cannot do it. And also uh, we, we usually present a list of locations and then they say, okay, this location is fine, but that location rather not because it's next to next to a, a school or to a police station or whatever. Uh, so we are usually in very good relation with the city. Um, we are also very happy that some uh, cities promote and also financially subsidize cargo bike sharing, because not in every city uh, we can uh, reach a positive business case yet. That's, that has to do with the uh, density, um, the cycling culture, which is not uh, as far in every city as it is in Amsterdam, maybe, or in Utrecht. Uh, so we are very happy to be able to operate, uh, uh, for example, in Leuven, where we get some subsidy. Uh, although it's a small city, there is big enthusiasm. Uh, but due to the size, we, we couldn't do that uh, commercially without some subsidy. Um, so that's how we work with cities. And we are very happy to, to continue doing that. Um, so it's maybe a bit long introduction, but I hope it was interesting for you. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the second question is for Lisbeth. Um, could you tell us a bit more about Ghent's circulation plan and how that has benefited Cyclogistics and the uptake of private cargo bikes? Uh, yes, yes, of course, I'm kidding. Uh, maybe first I'd like to congratulate you with the launch of the dashboard. I think it's a, a, a treasure of, of data and inspiration. Um, and we'll be definitely uh, be using it uh, to um, think of further uh, policies. So uh, thank you for that one. Um, now on the circulation plan for Ghent, um, we um, implemented it in 2017. It's a classical sum. So we um, divided the um, area inside the, the ringway in different zones. Um, and with um, motorized traffic, you can only go from one zone to another using the ringway. Um, and in the middle, there's a big uh, pedestrianized um, area. So that means that um, if you um, use a van for deliveries and pickups, um, you will have to go to one zone, back to the ringway, then to another zone, back to the ringway, then back to another zone. While um, if you would be using a cargo bike, you could just zoom through um, and, and um, be ready for the day. So of course that um, gave a huge advantage to uh, cargo bikes and delivery by cargo bikes, um, as opposed to uh, using the, the white fans. Um, and also in the pedestrian area, um, you need a permit to make deliveries there and you can only make deliveries um, in certain time slots. While um, for uh, cargo bikes, um, there's no such rule. So you can make deliveries 24 hours on 24 um, and you can um, park, you can park for free. Because it's not allowed to park uh, a car in the pedestrian zone, but you can park um, your, uh, cargo bike. So um, that made it very interesting for uh, businesses to uh, switch to uh, for some of their deliveries and some of their activities um, to uh, cargo bikes. Um, and also for families, um, it became much more interesting to um, use the cargo bikes um, because um, we want to get a, a livable city. So that's why we took the through traffic out with the, the circulation plan. 
um, and, and uh, a city for families and city where it's nice to live. Um, and it made it much more um, feasible to um, pick up your kids at school with a cargo bike and then bring her to um, music lessons and then get the groceries and uh, do it all in the one zooming motion um, like uh, you would do with a bike um, as opposed to if you would do the same thing with a car you would have to go to the ringway and then back into the zone and back to the ringway and back into the zone and then you wouldn't find parking space you would have to pay for parking space so um, that's why we saw a huge um, increase in the use of bikes um, and cargo bikes um, in the years since um, implementing the, the circulation plan. Great, thank you so much, Lisbeth. Um, Kevin, can you tell us a bit about what CIE is doing to support players in the cargo bike ecosystem? Thank you very much, uh, Anna Karen. And, and first off, let me say, um, congratulations CCF on the tool, the, the kind of ability to do benchmarking and data comparison is actually very much part of what we do in a broader industry sense. But partnering with uh, ECF and seeing what you put together just complements all the different tools of this kind that we're bringing forward. So it's really, really excellent. So congratulations on the launch. Yeah, I, I think the, the word ecosystem is the key here. And um, for people listening, maybe not got used to EU jargon, but it's very much the language of the moment in the way uh, what was called industrial transitions are happening in Europe, that each sector, each group of companies, each business, and even sectors like public-private partnerships and research are, are using the term ecosystem to really catch the whole business framework. And I think we see cargo bikes in, in really a split emerging, which is you know, when one talks about um, cargo bikes for domestic use, personal use, then it's really a subset of bicycles. Yeah, but it's a fantastic bicycle that can do so much more. But our industry and our city partners and our retailers and other people understand how to sell and maintain bikes for people. However, when you move across to commercial use, then actually we're entering an entirely new space. Or we have been in the past few years, because we're entering a world where companies that operate cargo bikes will be fleet managers. You know, they will be major actors like DHL and Amazon and UPS and others. They may be leasing companies that are leasing fleets or you're on doing this amazing work on sharing, which is, you know, some commercial use, but obviously cargo route is a commercial actor. And the pressures on those bikes for maintenance, for 24 seven uptime, uh, carrying heavy loads and increasingly the, the, the huge pressure is coming on our whole sector of bicycle industry, which is around digitalization. And the cargo bikes are at the far front of the forefront of this because you know, fleet managers are used to being digital. They track parcels. They know the efficiency of their fleets. They know the cost per unit and increasingly for the future will know the carbon footprint, the time, the efficiency, the productivity all of which is tracked digitally. So I think the first thing CIE has done is really establish conceptually that we must be a complete ecosystem. And I'm very proud of the um, Cargo Bike Expert Group we created some years ago. Um, Jaron is actually our, our chair now and thank him for his support in that work. But it does contain all of those actors. And if they're not there already, we can get them and get them to come to the table. And increasingly we must do so. Because if now it is, you know, Toyota and Renault distributing uh, cargo bikes, they're bringing expertise from an automotive ecosystem, but they bring expectations from an automotive ecosystem to the bicycle world that we haven't faced before. Um, so first job of CIE has been to create a community, to create an ecosystem space where we can have those conversations. Um, now we have to look to standards, to regulations, to internal standards within the industry about size and delivery capacity, um, internal standards like driver training. Uh, and thirdly, we have to support with research 
and we've done some research in this space and your tracker is a new contribution to that kind of research stroke analysis. But we know, for example, that the cargo bikes are currently probably the safest bike fleets in the whole of cycling. Millions of kilometers tracked by com in companies in the industry. Amazingly, not a single fatality on any of our research over a two year period. Um, that's remarkable. And it gives us enormous confidence that this is uh, actually safer than running the streets of, Brit of, of, of Europe with with vans that have a notorious record and, and freight deliveries that have a notorious record. So I think uh, for people on the call, just grab that idea of an ecosystem. Ask yourself, um, am I part of any kind of public private partnership that requires consistency between actors? And then you get an understanding of what we at CIE and our partners are trying to achieve with our work on cargo bikes and the cargo bike ecosystem. Great, thank you so much, uh, Kevin. The next question is for um, Jeda. So um, our dashboard shows that Vienna is one of the most cargo bike friendliest uh, cities in uh, Europe. Could you uh, just tell us a bit about uh, what measures have made the biggest impact um, in Vienna uh, when it comes to making the city more cargo bike friendly? Um, hi everyone, this is uh, Vienna calling. I feel like at the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, so thank you for the show, as they always say, or at least thank you for the uh, cargo bag dashboard, uh, which is very, uh, which is uh, which is a, a good effort, and uh, also as much as we might inspire uh, other cities, I also think we will uh, look for inspiration in what other cities have done. Uh, even what you have shown uh, in, in uh, I don't know, in Lyon and in other cities uh, sounds very interesting. So we will look into it. Thank you very much. Um, also, as you have shown the um, in that uh, cargo bike sharing part where we can see the evolution from 2010 uh, and until now. Um, so in Vienna, we started in 2017 with our uh, municipal uh, cargo bike sharing. And my point is uh, we are, we were already standing on the shoulders of giants, even if we are now like one of the maybe bike, uh, cargo bike friendliest cities, uh, we didn't reinvent the wheel and there were already a lot of people uh, riding cargo bike uh, in the nineties uh, and, and, and since. Um, so, I think what what has uh, to answer your question, uh, what has made uh, Vienna uh, um, so so bike friendly or so cargo bike friendly is um, at some point in 2017 uh, there has been a big push from from the city uh, for uh, at the same time we we have had uh, several uh, topics organized. Uh, one was the European Cycling. Cycle Logistic Federation uh, conference, which happened uh, in March uh, 2017 in Vienna. At the same time, we had uh, our first uh, subsidies for individual uh, to, to to buy the bikes, um, and this is the well, uh, as you shown on the on the on the dashboard, it was the first, and then it has been re. There had there have been a lot of iterations since, and it's still uh, going up uh, until 2026 at least. Um, at the same time, we created the Kretzelrad, so that cargo bike uh, sharing. So uh, it started with 10 bikes. At the moment, we have uh, 30 more or less, and it should grow. Also, I must say, again, standing in, in, on, the, on the shoulders of chance, uh, there was already uh, other kind of uh, cargo bike sharing in Vienna even. There was the Lastenrad Collective, which started uh, already in the I don't know, a few years before. Um, so, so again, the, there were a lot of things and it was just a matter uh, for the city to, to put them together, maybe to make an ecosystem to, to, to say as, as Kevin. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's mainly that, that, that push in 2017 that started uh, and uh, allowed a lot of people to, to buy a bike and to, or at least to, to subsidize their, their bike. Um, 
And I think also from, from the photos you have shown and, and other people have shown during their presentation, uh, what, uh, what's, what's always important is uh, the cargo bike is a nice object. It makes for nice photos. And uh, when it stands uh, somewhere in the street, then, and there are always more, of course. So, uh, so people notice and, and say, oh, okay, that that's might not by um, <laughs> might not be a good, might, might be a good idea and, uh, and, and see how they can uh, get one for themselves. Uh, thank you, Jodel. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, cargo bikes are very photogenic. Um, so our next question is for Jos. Um, So by 2025, uh, Rotterdam aims for a zero emission city logistics. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that and what role uh, cargo bike play in achieving that goal? Yes, gladly. Of course, I uh, joined the others in congratulating on introducing an interesting uh, instrument, which may be a helpful element in our uh, policy implementation as well in future. My background is I'm uh, mainly active in the field of urban freight and city logistics. So the, the private use of uh, cargo bikes is not really my expertise, uh, but I'm certainly interested in we are, we have a team of five people looking into city logistics in Rotterdam. And we are primarily occupied with preparations for introducing indeed a zone for zero emission city logistics by 2025, which doesn't cover all of the city, but the main part within the ring of national highways around the city, excluding the industrial areas uh, where a lot of bundling and uh, cross docking is going to take place in future. Um, and this uh, change to zero emission transport, of course, means a lot for very many uh, professional transporters uh, shippers and receivers um, and part of the solution is uh, is of course in model shift to a different type of vehicle uh, certainly a, a vehicle without emission but in many cases uh, that can be uh, a cargo bike and we have some really interesting examples of uh, switches already being made successfully uh, sometimes with a little subsidy which we could provide uh, but we have to. I have to stress that we, we, um, we are mainly interested in making city logistics more sustainable, and that means in our case, efficient and with minimum um, externalities, including the emission, but also the traffic safety. Of course, is a very important element. So I'm very interested in the the message that uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, told us that there is a, in their period of trial, not a single casualty. That's of course very relevant information to further promote the shift to cargo bikes. Um, although of course we keep stressing, we are not in, in favor of any type of vehicle as long as it can be proven that they are used efficiently. This may be done by sharing of course. Uh, so it also goes for uh, electric vans as much as for cargo bikes. Public space in general, of course, is a, a scarce commodity, even ever more scarce. Um, but to go uh, <clears throat> come back to your question, yes, there we definitely see a role, and it's already being uh, played uh, already in a modest way for cargo bikes in making the transition to the zero emission city logistics. Um, on the other hand, we do have a, a concern, and that is if half of all the transportation by vans could be substituted by cargo bikes, uh, then this really would be, uh, let's say, a major change. And that is why I had myself introduced as being involved in a simulation, uh, in a project developing a simulation tool for traffic, uh, urban traffic, freight traffic. Um, we actually uh, carried out the use case of a simulator to try and see what would happen if the potential, so the, the, the potential uh, model shift from van to cargo bike would indeed take place, then what would that mean on a normal working day for congestion on the cycling infrastructure we have in Rotterdam, which of course is relatively well developed, but it's not been developed, designed for, uh, let's say, maximum use for freight transport. So uh, although we promote, of course, all types of efficient and emission-free transport, we're also preparing and, and concerned that we create the right boundary conditions for 
this shift. And for that also, of course, we need information on how, how fast does this population of commercially used uh, urban freight uh, cargo bikes, uh, how fast does it grow to know that we are, let's say, uh, aware of, uh, of the possible need of perhaps even changing the layout of the, of the road infrastructure in the city to accommodate the new types of uh, transport, both for passengers and for um, urban freight. And one last aspect, of course, nine out of 10 vehicles monitored and the other motorized vehicles in the city uh, are passenger cars. So we're also very much interested, so the economy is very much interested, the urban economy, by making the modal shift from cars to cargo bikes, because that would create a lot of room for, um, let's say, the metabolism of the city, uh, so the, the, the transport of goods and also of waste out of the city or into the circular economy. Um, so also, I think that the, the private use of uh, cargo bikes is really uh, in the interest of uh, commercial uh, transport as well. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists for that first round of questions. We'd like to ask a few more, if that's all right. I think for round two, I wanna start with Lisbeth. And Lisbeth, um, so change doesn't happen immediately or overnight, although the circulation plan in Ghent was introduced practically overnight, uh, from what I understand. But um, was there a backlash when you introduced this? And you know, what were some of the convincing arguments that you then used to persuade you know, citizens and businesses um, of the benefits of, of cargo bikes and, and to increase the uptake? Okay. Um, it is true that the circulation plan was uh, implemented uh, in one night, but of course, uh, before the implementation, there were uh, years of consultations and uh, we spent a lot of time and effort um, consulting people and consulting businesses, uh, preparing them uh, and informing them um, and helping them to uh, prepare um, for um, a change. Um, but of course, there's always a backlash, especially when you um, tell drivers that they have to change uh, their habits. Um, that's not easy. And that's understandable because um, many people have been doing things a certain way and taking a certain route um, for less than 20, 30 years. Um, and then here's the city council saying, nope, <laughs> uh, you cannot drive by that way again, they have to go this way, and maybe you should try a bicycle. Um, but um, I talked to uh, many business owners, many organizations. Um, I went to to um, to visit them. I went to their uh, to their businesses. Um, a very important thing I noticed was that it's really important to um, really understand how they work. Um, because they are the experts on their own work. Um, I am the expert maybe on the circulation plan, but not, I'm not a plumber, I'm not a, uh, a business owner. So um, they know best what's possible and, and um, what's not. Um, and a cargo bike is not possible for everyone. And I'm pretty convinced that it's possible for a lot of people, a lot of businesses, uh, but not for everyone. Um, so the most convincing argument is not trying to convince people, uh, but just to look with them what their needs are and what, what's possible. Um, and um, in the conversations I've had, um, one of the things that's striking is that uh, for businesses, um, it wasn't always the efficiency of cargo bikes that was the most convincing argument. But uh, things like um, easy and free parking, um, and um, like Gilda always uh, already said, also the um, the marketing aspect, um, the fact that um, a cargo bike is, and especially in the in the early days in two thousand seventeen, um, cargo bike is very uh, visible in the street, um, and you show yourself as a an urban and modern and sustainable company. 
and um, people will um, much sooner notice uh, a flashy cargo bike um, than uh, another white van with a logo on it. So that uh, is sometimes uh, an argument that I did not expect to find, but that is uh, has, has proven to be uh, a convincing one. Um, and also the, the parking, of course, but you can, it's not allowed to park um, the car in the pedestrian zone, but it's allowed to park bicycles, as long as you're not in the way of pedestrians. Um, and in the city center, as we all know, it's not always easy to find a parking space for cars, uh, but we take really care to um, get um, space for cargo bikes wherever we have um, uh, bike spaces. Um, and we try to have bike spaces within 100 meters of every house. So that makes it easier to park your cargo bike or in a, a bike rack, near bike rack, or just uh, in the street or on the, on the pavement. Um, and for um, families and other organizations, it's also often the argument uh, to just give it a try. Uh, so you don't have to buy anything. I'm not trying to convince you to do anything. Just try it. We have different uh, ways of trying, uh, of um, letting people try cargo bikes. You can rent them for really short times. We have the, the schemes where you can um, try them for a couple of weeks in your company and then let us know how it works. We have the, the cargo bike sharing scheme. Um, so we have all these, these different uh, ways of just trying one. Um, and that's often one of the most convincing ways to uh, get people aboard, um, especially um, if you have uh, the kids in the cargo bike. We all know the most convincing people on the planet are your children. Uh, it's so much fun to be in this cargo bike that they will go uh, looking to um, get one of their own um, and hopefully replace their um, car or second car uh, with, a, with a cargo bike, because that's, of course, um, a big part of the, the aim of um, getting people on cargo bikes, um, is um, to encourage them to a more sustainable mode of transport. Okay. Thanks very much for those insights. Yeah, not, not always the, the most obvious ones I would have thought of either, but uh, thanks for sharing those. That's, that's really great. Um, let's hear a bit about um, Vienna, so Gilda. I'm sure that you've had challenges there as well when um, implementing some of the measures that have made Vienna more cargo bike friendly. Uh, the last time I was in Vienna, I think I saw one of the more smaller uh, challenges. Uh, I saw parking spaces for cargo bikes. I think it was on the Alsastrasse, not far from the, the town hall. And I saw that the parking spaces were full of mopeds. <laughs> so, I, so I think one of your challenges might be to Keep the keep the parking spaces for the cargo bikes rather than the motorized vehicles, but um, tell us about some of your challenges and how you've addressed them. Sure, um, I am not very much aware about uh, about uh, as you said the uh, mopeds taking. I, I mean, sometimes it it happens, but there are also some moped uh, parking racks which look like. Uh, which look like bike rack, but but it, there is a smaller uh, there's smaller sticker uh, on it showing it. I, I I don't know, but it's okay. It might be a good question for another time. I took a uh, picture, so I'll, I'll so I can okay tell you okay myself. okay. <laughs> um, but but I think well a, a very big backlash. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, that we had a big backlash, but uh, I think there are there are maybe three uh, challenges uh, for the for the measures uh, in in Vienna. Um, the first one, uh, and it's interesting because everyone has a, has another experience. But it's uh, the thing with businesses. If you, um, I mean, we we always uh, differentiate individuals from businesses, and uh, the subsidies the, the we have had in Vienna from 2017 were for individuals, not for businesses. Um, and I think in general, it's it's difficult to reach uh, or to to make businesses change because uh it's kind of a step down from a, from when you have car or from you have a, a fleet of cars uh, to to change to a fleet of bikes or even cargo bikes um so there there's a, a lot of work to be done here uh but we are trying to do it um and and also the the 
imp important or, or, or interesting interesting thing here is the small businesses which are maybe one or two people and might uh, get early uh, earlier on on the on the boat uh, with cargo bags um, because they can use it also on the weekend individually that's that's the thing with the very small businesses at least um, so I think that's where we can have a foot in the door is uh, is to to start talking to small businesses and to then uh, use the the good arguments uh, from Ghent uh, about marketing and free parking uh, to reach uh, to to the bigger to the bigger companies. But that remains a, a challenge. Uh, another one, of course, it's everywhere. Is the infrastructure, which is more done for cars than for uh, bikes and even more than for cargo bikes um here uh you you mentioned at the, at the beginning your keynote uh by high high, high quality infrastructure so uh, Vienna is, is trying to buy some uh high quality infrastructure of course it's not not every um bike path uh, that is being built or, or renewed will be high quality but we are trying to have also a very wide uh, bike paths so that uh, so that cargo bike is, is not a problem uh, on those bike paths um and i think the 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 last challenge um is the inclusion as we said um we have to to pay attention also to uh, to elderly to families with children of course to disabled and uh, the there are a lot of people who might, in fact, start uh, riding a cargo bike, but who, who were not uh, used to. Uh, so also, for example, with that Kretzel uh, Rad project, uh, project uh, um, cargo bike sharing, um, we, for example, we, we pay attention that we have uh, single track bikes and, uh, and multi-track bikes. Because for for uh, some people it's important to 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 be sure about the stability. And if I'm at the, at the uh, red light and my children start crying, for example, I can uh, I, I don't have to put the the feet of the bikes or something, but I can uh, straight away um, take care of them. Um, so yeah, there there are, there are a lot of of things to to think about the inclusion, and I'm glad it's a point on your uh, on your dashboard. Um, yeah, I think that, that that would be about the challenges. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, we'd like to also hear from Rotterdam on that. And, and Jos, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, what are Rotterdam's plans for promoting the use of cargo bikes um, in future? Um, yeah, well, it won't be a surprise, of course, that we also have a facility for uh, companies to try out alternative vehicles, including a range of uh, bikes. Of course, this is also in the interest, in the interest of the manufacturers. Um, so sometimes for a modest fee, they can try them out for a couple of weeks to, uh, to get the hands-on experience. And uh, so that's one very simple step we, uh, we already take. Uh, and as I said, we are, we are also um, very much interested in making sure that the boundary conditions are there for the type of uh, logistics we want, including uh, a larger portion of, of cargo bikes, for instance, by trying to um, to establish rules for uh, urban development projects, uh, which up till now have mainly included regulations for car parking space, to also, um, if necessary, regulate, and if possible, by the way, uh, for projects or, or redevelopments uh, to somehow assess the, the logistic performance of a building, be it a, an apartment building or an office tower or uh, shops or a combination, uh, so that uh, as much as possible, all the logistic handling can be done uh, outside the public domain, which, as I said, is a scarce commodity growing ever scarcer. Um, and of course, for that, you need uh, experience also huh, to make sure that you have enough and you don't allocate too much um, and if it's impossible then of course you have a good case for claiming public space anyway uh, 
so that's the kind of uh, concern we have uh, to make sure that, that this ecosystem can flourish, including the, the let's say the appropriate percentage of uh, cargo bikes. And I think there may be a differentiation in future for several parts of the city, perhaps even uh, uh, varying over time. So an access regime which favors some type of logistic vehicles depending on the nature of the part of the city and perhaps even the use of that part. So I think, for instance, a very simple example of uh, areas with schools with large flows of children around certain times of day, then actually you wouldn't want any traffic, especially not the, the heavier kind. And I think cargo bikes within the family of bicycles, of course, are the heavier ones. Uh, so although no casualties have been reported in two years, as Kevin mentioned, then still you want to make sure that, uh, I know from my own experience in the coal single, a very central uh, road, which has been downgraded um, from the point of view of passenger cars, has been very much upgraded from the point of view of cyclists. So there's a, you could say a highway now almost and a very broad uh, pavement for uh, pedestrians, but it's, become actually much more dangerous to cross this, in my personal experience, this uh, street, because of the relatively high speeds of the, the cyclists, uh, including cargo bikes on the high quality uh, infrastructure. So that's really a point of attention. I think we, uh, uh, we should keep in mind. So the safety aspect. Uh, and then, well, one other thing, of course, to link back to the, the occasion, uh, the dashboard, would be very helpful for us if it could somehow uh, also indicate how much uh, cargo bikes are actually in use, being used for um, for urban freight transport. So I'm not sure which parameter you could use, but I can imagine we have a, a family of covenant partners for the introduction of our zero emission zone, uh, some of which are actually uh, carrying out transport, others are receivers or shippers, uh, but Perhaps you could monitor the, the, the fleet compositions or the percentage of, of, uh, of cargo bikes within a fleet, which could be an interesting indicator perhaps for, let's say, the uptake of, uh, of cargo bikes. Okay. Thanks very much for that suggestion, Jos. We will look into that and, and thanks for your insights there. Um, Kevin, I would like to ask you from the industry perspective, what do you think are the next key developments in, in cycle logistics? Uh, thanks, Jill. I think uh, actually it spins quite nicely of what colleagues have already said, but in a kind of policy framework, um, we've used the term SUMPs today, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans. Um, sustainable Urban Mobility Plans will be followed quickly by SULPs, Sustainable Urban Logistics Plans. And certainly they will effectively be a legal requirement in something like 400 cities that are part of the Trans-European Network. So your sump will not be enough unless it has a comprehensive logistics plan as well. And I think, you know, Joss has got that wrong, which is a, a great example, but that's actually coming to you for many of you listening. And of course, we want to make sure that the cargo bike, particularly commercial cargo bike is recognized in that process and in those policies. And, and it is strongly recognized in a number of the key supporting European Union documents, but that doesn't mean that's known about when it arrives at a local city. So both the CIE community and the ECF community and others and other people on this call start asking the SALT question uh, to look at what's coming in terms of policy frameworks. The second thing I would say is actually talking about, for example, some of those challenges of SMEs. Um, we're a long, long way from full exploitation of the potential business models and business routes. Um, automotive light freight, like commercial vehicles, is dominated by fleet management companies and leasing companies. And until every leasing company that leases cars in Europe actually offers some cargo bikes, then we will fall short. So we have a whole new ecosystem to break into um, and to break into half our communities. And it's coming. I mean, it's a big thing. Um, and I'm based in Belgium, like some of the other people on the call. Uh, many of the banks in Belgium offer bikes alongside their automotive leasing, but we're really talking about commercial fleet management. And 
to some extent, we as an industry have to step up because that's a very data driven sector. They need full cost of ownership, they need very high um, uptimes. But uh, the automotive sector knows how to make buying a van and renting a van really, really easy. You know, you get a package, you get a maintenance package, an insurance package, a leasing package, a cost package. It's so easy. So if you're a small business, at the end of your lease, you phone up, you get the next van. Now we're going to be in a situation where you can phone up and get the next van, but it's a cargo bike. So that's that's the second thing. We've a long way to go in that space, but it's things we have to do. And then thirdly, I think I see many questions in the chat about the relationship between cargo bikes and infrastructure, which colleagues have already mentioned, and linking it to access. At a European level, the most complex discussion we're actually having is not only that relationship with access and infrastructure, but then with standards. Now, there are um, European standards under development for what are being called carrier cycles. Uh, for those that ask the question, including child carriage, you need to, there's a working group in SEN that's working on this. Um, but there is a, a broad split of opinions going into that space. For example, yeah, let's take a Dutch situation. Feedback from consumer groups, feedback from certain cities would be our bike lanes are full. So please keep your cargo bikes small and narrow and tidy because we don't want them in the way. Um, in another country where there's almost zero infrastructure, the discussion is the place of the cargo bike on the road. And actually the cargo bike, it's okay for it to be a meter wide, to have a trailer, to be slow moving. And actually nobody minds too much if it slows down the traffic because it acts as a kind of traffic calming device. But to try and manage that from a European standards point of view is chaotic. Um, because we know now that the one thing we need to do to succeed is to get cargo bikes to go everywhere, particularly anywhere that is access restricted. Um, and it's quite easy now for cities because, for example, the, the, the category of vehicles that are called type approved, you know, which is cars and motorbikes, can be easily excluded by regulations. But what about a heavy cargo bike that's sort of type approved under the new regulations? If we had to have 500 individual city regulations to give special permits for these cargo bikes to enter, it will take years for all of you cities to respond. But the, the European Union doesn't have the power to regulate those things, their national government or city level. But it does have the power to decide whether cargo bikes are type approved or European approved. And then the industry has its own standards. Should you better take a Euro pallet? Should it be designed by certain companies that they want to take certain loads of certain configurations? Um, it's really complex. And it is really not necessarily at the moment reaching consensus around what we need to do around this area. What I would say, and I think great examples from the three cities already on this call, you need to be very clear what you want. If you believe that cargo, particularly commercial cargo and logistics, with three wheelers, four wheelers, trailers, loads, three, four, 500 kilograms, should be coming to your city to replace vans. I'm going to tell you they should, but if that's what you want, you as a city actually need to be in a discussion with your national government and asking the question, what is our government saying to the commission? Because at the moment, for example, there've been a lot of noises about trotting at scooters and it's forcing people to go, all these new technologies are a pain. All these new technologies are blocking up our city and cargo bikes get sucked into that. And there's a search for blanket regulations. Um, we're extremely concerned. It's a cornerstone of our work to try and manage some of that kind of chaotic messaging. Um, but ultimately, as a professional sector in logistics and deliveries, this has to be resolved. Um, but this is really, really back to public-private partnership. The cycle logistics companies are often quite small, they're SMEs. They're often, you as cities have done a great job nurturing them to join this space. You don't want European decision killing off all that work, but you equally don't want to let something unsafe 
suddenly come out all over your cities. So um, we will need to work with you over the coming year or two to actually fully understand what it means to have cargo bike access in every city in Europe, not just Dutch and Belgian cities with good infrastructure, but what does it mean in the Mediterranean basin? What does it mean in Eastern Europe where there isn't that infrastructure? And then how do we facilitate uh, a really exciting transition to cargo bikes? Um, so that's coming. Uh, it's gonna be complex, but it's essential that it's work we do and then we come out the other side with a, a broad European consensus. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much um, for those thoughts. Um, I, I would like to turn over to Anna Karina, who's been monitoring the Q&A, to uh, bring a, a couple of last questions uh, before we close. Uh, over to you, Anna Karina. Yeah, so we'd like to give the audience a chance to also ask questions. If you have any questions for our panelists, put, please put them in the uh, Q&A box. So I can already see a question for your room. Uh, and it is, what percentage of Cargo's customers group um, are business owners? And the person also like to know if they stay active in cargo bag sharing or if they go on to purchase a cargo bag afterwards. Hi. Uh, currently, it's about 20% of our users that we think are businesses. Um, that ranges from flower shops, bakeries, uh, people having an uh, independent uh, uh, occupancy like uh, service technicians, uh, people who do massage or uh, house hairdressers. Um, uh, it's an estimate because not all users register as a company they could register under their uh, personal name. So we don't know exactly, but it's around 20%. Um, certainly some of those will go on to buy a cargo bike, which also goes for our uh, uh, consumer customers, which is fine because if you use a cargo bike uh, four times a day and you have three kids, it's probably good to, to have one yourself. And what we see is by uh, having the sharing scheme in, in cities, uh, loads more people get uh, the the ability to try it out because for many people it's scary in the beginning uh, once they've tried it they see that it's not as difficult as they think and uh, so we think we enlarge the, the 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 range of people that are able to try it out and some of them will buy it yes okay thank you and um, then we have a question about infrastructural changes um, as a result of promoting cargo bikes and if that has led to wider bike lanes, uh, parking spaces or any design changes, I think that's a good question for um, the cities. Maybe Lisa, do you want to take that one? Uh, thank you. Um, I think in design changes, the, I'm not sure what the English word is, but the turning circle you need to have with, to, to make a turn with the cargo bike is um, different from normal bikes. So that's the thing that we're really paying attention to now in uh, new designs. Um, and another thing is um, concerning the, the discussion about there's uh, not enough space on the cycle track is um, there's still a lot of space on the car lanes. Um, so what we're trying to do in Ghent is reduce the speed everywhere to uh, 30 kilometers an hour. Uh, so that it's more safe to uh, share the roads um, where there's spaces. Great, thank you. Um, Gilda, could you um, tell us a bit about the infrastructural changes you've made in Vienna? Or how you have adapted your infrastructure um, to cargo bikes, for example, through wider bike lanes, parking spaces? Um. I don't think we have made that many changes in that regard. Uh, as well, back to the to the bike racks, we also have broader uh, bike racks so that some uh, cargo bikes can 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 park there. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I I have no risk. And then, yeah, yes, uh, yes, same question for you. What infrastructural changes have you made to um, accommodate cargo bikes? Well, <clears throat> so far, uh, I don't think we have made uh, 
uh, adaptations, especially for cargo bikes. So for cycling in general, we have we, uh, we have for quite a long time been trying to improve conditions. Um, we are anticipating, uh, let's say, the situation where there's an increasing number of cargo bikes um, in use, especially commercially, but perhaps the combination of private and, and commercial use is even more urgent in that uh, respect. And I know some colleagues of mine have been part of a national working group looking into, let's say, the, the, the principles for uh, uh, an alternative layout of, of urban streets to make them as safe as possible, which came down to, if I remember correctly, an organization in terms of energy. So if you have a heavy option vehicle, then they should drive slower. Yeah? Um, so they have the same, more or less the same uh, limited uh, uh, effect when a collision would happen. Of course, uh, we do what we can to avoid that. And the other thing I think Lisbeth already mentioned uh, is we are also considering an effect already starting to introduce in certain parts of the city, the speed limit of 13 kilometers per hour, 30 kilometers per hour, which of course is probably going to help in, in reducing the problem, uh, at least not making it bigger than it uh, needs to be. Okay, we are coming up at time. I want to thank everybody for having participated uh, today, our panelists, um, as well as our participants online. Um, if you want to be part of the industry conversation, check out Cycling Industries Europe if you're not already a member. Come to Velo City, 9th to the 12th of May in Leipzig this year. If you're from a city and you're not part of our Cities and Regions for Cyclists Network, um, join us and, and be part of those conversations. And uh, finally, if you'd like to support our further work on the dashboard, because we are looking for, for funders, get in touch with us so that we can continue this great work, which is very resource intensive uh, to do. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon at, at one of these occasions. Yeah, thank you.